Good afternoon and welcome to the 36th Colorado Convention in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is um, April the 6th, it's 4.15 p.m. and this is the History, Heritage, and uh, what was the third word? In the History, Heritage, Tradition, thank you, interview. And uh, I'm Johnny Wedge and I'm your moderator. And our panelists are here, we'll, we'll talk more about them each in a minute, but our panelists are Cal Golden, Marshall Flippo, Wade Driver, and Jim Mayo. Now, if you've read your copy of Direction, you'll see that Cal Golden's name wasn't there. He's an add-on at the very end, and that's the surprise that it stated in there. News at five. I want to tell you a little bit about how this session came to be. Back in 1996, Square Dance Caller, Bob Brundage, who was at the time very closely associated with the uh, Lodgeau Foundation, took on a project to interview many of the leaders of Square Dancing throughout the world. His project was designed for three categories. He wanted to interview all of the recipients of the American Square Dance Society Sets and Honor Hall of Fame. He wanted to interview all of the recipients of the Call of Lab Milestone Award, and he wanted to interview all of the recipients of the Round the Lab uh, Silver Halo Award. And after he finished that, while he was doing it, he also started interviewing other people. And he tells us that when he got into his 80s, and oh, by the way, the way he did this was to attend New England conventions, uh, New England, sorry about that, National Square Dance Conventions, Call of Lab Conventions, and some Round the Lab Conventions. Some of them he would then drive right to call his homes and do them there or do them at other festivals and weekends where calls were. But when he got into his 80s, he found that was a little tough, all his traveling. So the balance of them he did from his home on the telephone with a machine he had that could hook onto his phone and take them. In 2004, he associated himself with the Square Dance Foundation of New England, and that's how I get into the picture. We, did, we put everything he has on, on our website. We originally put on all the transcribed copies, you could go there and read these interviews. Then later we were very excited when our webmaster helped us out and we put the actual interviews, the actual taped interviews. You could go there now and listen to Bob Van Antwerp talking to Bob Brundage. Uh, you could listen to uh, Frankie Lane talking to Bob, and of course these gentlemen. And so it was quite exciting. Well, the executive committee decided that why don't we try a little bit of that at this session. So I'm changing the names of things. This is moderator, but I'm actually the interviewer. And they're not panelists, they're actually the interviewees. And Bob Brundage interviewed them from, tell me uh, what life was like before you were square dancing, where were you born and raised? Well, these interviews were 45 minutes to an hour. We've got an hour and 15 minutes interview for people, so we're gonna make it much shorter. And what we've chosen is to pick a subject close to the heart of each of these interviewers. And I'm going to start with this gentleman on my left. This is Cal Golden. <laughs> Cal, is, you were going to be the last one? Okay. <laughs> well, if that's what you'd like, that's what we'll do. Jim Mayo was up here. He, he was originally, he has volunteered to back off a little bit and give more time to Cal. So we're going to call on Jim in just a minute or two, but then we'll start, okay, from there with Wade Driver. Wade is from, I hope I got this right, the Woodlands, Texas. Close that up. That should be on, yeah. And um, I, I looked up a little some things about calls, and I see that Wade called his first singing call in December 1957. But anyway, what we've decided to interview Wade about is record producing, and what it was like in record producing <coughs> In the early years, and I guess you might have started where in the 60s in the record business? Well, it was Square Dancing 75. 75, okay. Before it was Square Dancing. Alright, and, and what it was like to produce these records in those days, I guess most of your stuff was done with live music. Have you read the rhythm rockers? Or? Yep. Okay. Yes, it was. Talk to us. <laughs> Are we ready? I, I love it. But this is very rarely do I ever get to be the youngest person on the panel. I just love this. I'm all over this. I just love it. Now, first of all, I got to say, look who I'm sitting with. You don't think I'm not honored? Good Lord. Look at this. This is Conan. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's all over there. Anyway, 
I, uh, I started a record company in 75 uh, out of default because I, I was going full-time calling and I was recording at the time with Roland Burbach and he and I had philosophical differences when it came to music. I paid a lot of money to say philosophical differences. <laughs> but no, seriously, uh, I wanted something a little, a little newer, a little different, and it was kind of, you know, going off. So we kind of put a band together and, and gave it a shot. And you never know if it's going to work or not. But the record business back then and uh, was the you know, minority recorded a few records for for Bogan. I think my very first record was one of the most difficult I had because I was in the in the studio and I had not cut anything since rock and roll days when you were still cutting on discs and cutting live and stuff like that. And I, so I was in the studio and I had my eyes closed. I thought I'm going to get through this. I'm not going to make a mistake. And I got all the way to the closer and I opened my eyes and there was a plate glass window between you and the control room. And this person had his face pushed up against the window and it was gone. It was just all over. <laughs> Right there. So you go back and you start all over again, right? But whenever I started pressing records, uh, was nine, they were 19 cents each. Lord, they have those days again. We went and we cut a one-inch tape, had eight tracks, and uh, we used a drummer and a guitar player and a, and a keyboard player, a banjo player, and a bass player, and that's what we did. And they played and you sang, and you got through and hope it works. And uh, the mixing was, uh, you always made sure that uh, the engineer had a pint of black jacket on the floor under the, under the console. Am I right? Would I lie? <laughs> but uh, back then, it was, a, it was easier in some regards, more difficult than others. We did not have the technical uh, innovations that we, we have today. And so everything was a little more about the seat of your pants. But on the other side, according to were 14 record distributors at that time all over the country, everything from Corsair out west to uh, Bob Schreiber out east and everywhere, and everywhere in between. And um, so distribution was easier, uh, the cost was less. Uh, your basic pressing record was 19 cents and, and uh, by the time you had it mastered and everything else, you charged a dollar a record, you know. and. Uh, and there was nothing to sell three, four, five, six, seven, eight thousand records. Well, them days are gone. I'll tell you what. I want to sell Santa Dear 80. It's happy today. But uh, the as it would progress, when you first started off, and it's the learning process, but when you record a record, you send this thing to uh, well, I said mine, but first I sent it to Los Angeles to have it mastered. I don't know how many are familiar with this thing, but you have to make you have to make an acetate floppy master and then they dip it in nickel plating to make the records. Well, the problem we had was if you cut at that what I call modern records, power, power rings, Waylon and Willie outlaw type right, music, if your grooves get to be very easily damaged, those are the record skips a lot. So we went from that process to double and triple plating processes. And, but over the years, it, it, uh, it, it, it's really modernized. But the original, it was funny, you go down and you see like these long lines of machines and they have little balls of vinyl like this big and drop them in the pot and it's like making waffles. <laughs> you do this way, you trim around the side, you spit one out and go do another one. Now everything's modernized and mechanized and automatic and, and I'm not sure it's gone a bit better but uh, but it was an interesting process back then and you always made sure if there was a major holiday coming up that you had all your record orders in and pressed at least two days before then. Because when the holiday came up, all the pressing operators all got drunk. You didn't see them for a week, 10 days. And so if you didn't have it before then, don't have to count it for two weeks later. Right? So it, it, was, it was quite different back then. But it's, it's still a labor of love. And, uh, and we got a, it, it's, it's just a fun thing. But uh, it, it's, man, I would not trade for anything in the world. It's, you know, I, I, I don't know about y'all, but I, all my kids are artistically inclined. They draw beautiful pictures on can't draw a straight line with a ruler. So uh, it, this is kind of my bed. <laughs> it is as artistic as I get. But it's been fun. And uh, uh, I, I've enjoyed it. We have a lot of guys making good music. And uh, it's tougher nowadays with live musicians. But uh, you know, we do the best you can. But wait, if another call came to you during that period of time, you talked about the, the days when we sold 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, and, 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 and recorded. 
would he have to come to your studio in order to do the recording? I don't want to. When I first started, the first one we did, we did live vocals. And then Don Franklin was the first one that did that on Wagon Wheel. He made you go in, one of the bands playing, and you sang with them. And what you got was what, what you heard, what you got, it was done. And my very first session, we did that way. But after that, uh, we finally got where I could go in while they were playing, and you would do a dummy vocal. And you'd sing along with them. But I like to do that because I kind of, you know, instruct and help them as long as go along. And, you know, you're kind of talking through the mic like the fiddle player, is that the best you can do? I'd like to have a little better than that next time, you know, things like that. And uh, so when you finally get done, then you had the capability of going back to that eight track and remixing and putting a vocal down later. You know, and so normally if somebody came in, I would do the music first. As I learned very early on that that's the, the true concept of too many cooks full the broth. And uh, I don't know, one time I took all my recording artists and all went in there. You have any idea how many opinions I had and how many recommendations? And it just was like really bad. So nobody went to And you cut it and you get done and then you say, here, sing this song. It worked a lot better. But I think our question was going to be, when, when, and other, other than yourself, another caller came to record, what kind of financial arrangements were made in those days? They must, must have made money. Well, no. And everybody, you had, because you had as many ways of doing it as, as you under the stars. A lot of guys would, would charge the callers. Uh, some guys paid royalties on it. I kind of, you know, when I was in athletics, I was never big enough to play football a whole lot. And, and I ran track, and I liked track for because if you lost, you were humiliated, but you were the only one to blame. If you won, it was wonderful because you were the only one to blame. And I tried to run my record company the same way. If they didn't sell, my bad. But they sold my good, and I just did it that way. So uh, I did not charge my artist, but I didn't pay them either. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we are uh, going to allow for each interview. Anyone in the audience would like to ask any questions, we do have a microphone. So if you do want to, please raise your hand. We'll run the microphone to you. Please identify yourself before you start speaking. You know your name and where you're from and those kind of things. Anyone want to ask Wade any questions? Yes, it will cost you. <laughs> Wait, oh, Jerry John, tell them about trying to talk to the band, what you wanted for Square Dance, and when you finally discovered that you had to talk about a trash can beat. What are oh, you mean by, by, my, my, well, you get innovative in there, and one of my very favorite, I'm assuming you told about the, the stool in the bathroom, and yeah, okay, well, <laughs> One of my favorite recording stars in the country music business is Don Williams. And Don Williams had just a wonderful look at his boom, 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 boom. Well, for square dancing, it's like dancing with a broken foot. And that just wasn't going to work. We had this beautiful track with a rhythm track that just didn't get it done. And I said, I got to have, have some kind of upbeat. Well, the band had gone home. And I said, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, so I took a drumstick and turned around with a big end sticking out and I took a big wooden bar stool and I went in the bathroom. Because you get built an echo in the bathroom. And I said, stick a microphone in here and I'll do it. It works. So when you pin the two expert in everything, that's me on the bar stool. <laughs> Wade. Yes, sir. Did any of your family call or anything? Well, no. Yes, no. Uh, my oldest. But he's played drums on several sessions for me. And I think he uh, wrote the whole musical score for Hooked on Elvis and played the, the drums, and he played on one of our later sessions. <coughs> but my next son never called, but my first wife, Glory, had a clogging group, and she decided to run an amateur night one time. And uh, we were discussing how we were going to run it. She said, Well, what we're going to do is we're going to have everybody that wants to call, come and call, and we'll give a $50 prize to the best one. We didn't know John was listening. He was nine years old in the other room. So the son came up to do this thing, and he said, I want to go. That's why he said, well, I want to go. So he went, he had memorized Rocky Time. He went up, he called him, he wanted $50, but he had never called again. <laughs> 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 that was his one time. <laughs> Thank you. That, no. Okay, we've, we've got just so much time, and we're going to come back at the time, the time at the end and, and, and bring Wade back. But for now, we're going to move on. To our next interviewee, um, yeah, well, Jim, the, the, you, you wanna, Jim Mayo from Hampstead, New Hampshire. A very brief story, actually. Uh, before Call Lab had its first meeting in 1974, we still were the 
early group that was talking about making this kind of an organization, talking about one of the important things we had to do was to train callers. And several of us were involved in teaching callers, but we thought it would be a good idea to agree on a curriculum, on, on what subjects we would cover, and a brief outline of what those subjects were. Uh, in 73 sometime, I think it was, I remember it very well because it was my very first flight as an instrument rated pilot by myself in actual instrument condition. I called and danced in Rochester, New York, and the meeting that we had set up, because a lot of those callers were in New England right then, was in Hartford. And uh, Al Brundage was there, Earl Johnston, uh, Ron Schneider, Frank Lane, all of them happened to be in New England at that time, and so we gathered them and Dick Ledger. And we met at a motel in, at the airport in Hartford to talk about the curriculum. And we went whipping through and came up with a dozen subjects, no problem, uh, agreed mostly on what to say about them, and then we got to timing. <laughs> and some of you who know Dick Ledger know that he has a very solid view of timing, and it is calculated in eights. And only eights will do. Uh, every call must be given on the last two beats of an eight so that the dancers can step off on beat one of an eight. And for Dick, the whole subject of timing was summed up with the music and the musical phrase. Uh, Dick used choreography that worked only in fours and eights, and it always did the music. The rest of us had moved into a more choreographically free modern square dance mode, and some of our calls didn't fit eights. We spent three hours trying to agree on a definition of time, and we didn't even get close. It was 1984, I believe, that the curriculum guidelines for caller coaches, technical supplement, finally got written, and the first chapter that we haggled over was timing. Dick Ledger was still there, along with Deco Deck, Bill Peters, myself, and uh, Walt Cole, and John Colton. And we spent almost six months, and more rewrites than you can imagine, and we came out with a compromise we could all live with, and that's still there today. There you go. We're going to move on to our next interview, E, from now from Tucson, Arizona. He's going to, we're going to work with Marshall Flippo and ask him what it was like to be a traveling caller in those early days. You know, my, my, my question is, before you left home, would you, would you lay out a route you were going to travel, go to California, come across talk, go into the New England area and head back home six months later, or, or did you just Go here, and when somebody else hired you, you'd go there. How did you work all that out as a travel? It was kind of a structure. Getting back to records. <laughs> I started when they were. Did you start when they were 70? Yeah, oh yes. Yeah, 70. He started. Cylinder. <laughs> no, we didn't have one. I went to Kirkwood and we had to give up two jobs uh, to go there. And uh, we knew I'd have to travel for six months, so I stayed at Kirkwood Lodge for six months. Then I'd take off on tour in the middle of October. And uh, for about 42 years, I drove up through Iowa, Minnesota, back over into Wisconsin, and uh, to work Chula Vista and up across and Spooner, Wisconsin, and uh, some of the little burger part had really good cheese, and I can't remember the name of it. But, uh, <laughs> they'd take me out there for just a boy with cheese in the factory. Is that what you call it? That's cheese factory. Like yeah. <laughs> had the great curds. I said, Kurt. <laughs> and anyway, uh, I had to work uh, Chula, 
this uh, was our turn, Wisconsin Dales, uh, for a weekend. And for years I did two weekends there. And uh, in between the two weekends, I'd go down into uh, Illinois and work myself back up over to uh, uh, Chulam and do another weekend. And right after that weekend, we'd do the Sunday morning goodbye session at Chulam. I'd go to Rockford that afternoon. And uh, then I'd drive to Chicago because I had to go to Kokomo the next day, but I'd drive into Chicago after the dance on uh, Sunday. And uh, this is a story that uh, probably uh, shouldn't tell. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're getting tired when you get in there, so I just plopped out across the bed there in my clothes. I woke up about two hours later and just getting about 11, 15, 12 at night, and I was hungry, so I wanted to go out, and I had a lot of cash with me. So I took that cash, and I put it in a little ball, and put it around the spindle on the toilet paper, and put the toilet paper back on her. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> went out and got camper, came back the next day. Uh, uh, my next day was Coco, Indiana. Got down there. And have supper. Took my bill fold out. Oh man! I called that motel to thank the Lord. Called that motel, and he said, "How big was the roll of toilet paper?" I said, "About half." Well, he said, "Sometimes the maid just take it, throw it away, and it gets down a little low." So I go look. And after a while, he came back, and uh, he said, "I got sixty twenty dollar bills here in my hand." And I said, "Oh my God! Thank the Lord. Send it all home." I knew she was spending for it. <laughs> 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 no, she is really, really pretty, really good. But uh, uh, I looked out there the very next year, the same thing. I ain't going to put it no around the toilet paper. <laughs> so I put it on the floorboard of the car, uh, the floor mat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I took off Kokomo again. Oh, there's a car work, pulling in that sucker. <laughs> <laughs> and it, you know, you hear a lot about Chicago, but it's always been good. <laughs> Even, you know, the dances, the crowds and everything. But, uh, I was uh, walking that big tunnel, going to pay the cashier at the car work. Back at the, the door I came through, opened, little black guy. Hey, sir. This almost went down. <laughs> oh. The vacuum cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, then uh, we'd uh, take off across and go up to uh, into Michigan and uh, uh, Plainwell and uh, uh, Detroit and Kalamazoo, Battle Creek. Uh, anyway, through Michigan, then down into Ohio, and then over into Pennsylvania. And I was working toward the East Coast and uh, Worked uh, almost seven years without Brandy to Atlantic City uh, on a weekend with the Easter days on the rounds. And uh, when the casinos came in, they tore our hotel down. <laughs> <laughs> so we went up to West Point then after that. And then I, after West Point, well, I went down to Commonwealth, uh, New Jersey, down into Trenton, and then down into uh, Wilmington, uh, Dover, over into uh, uh, Dover. I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did the uh, yeah Spring Festival there in Washington. I believe seventeen years. But then I've gone up into uh, Pennsylvania again and over into Mechanicsburg. State College, Greensburg. Then I kind of hit South Coast, it's getting more at Christmas time or December time. Or down through uh, uh, into Lexington, uh, on Charleston, no, Lexington, Lexington, anyway, down through uh, uh, Kentucky, mm -hmm. and uh, then over into, uh, well, still in Kentucky, I carbon and uh, 
Lexington, then down into Knoxville, and then down into Birmingham. <laughs> and I did, for years I did uh, Birmingham Christmas dance, Memphis Christmas dance, and Little Rock Christmas dance. And then I'd uh, stop in Dallas and call, and then I'd go home. Well, Lisa went with me. And we think traveling three weeks is bad. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this lasted uh, usually uh, from the middle of October to Christmas time, or close to Christmas time. And I'd finish up in, uh, in Dallas and then go on into Abilene. And Lisa went with me the first uh, three years, and then John came along. And uh, by the way, he's going to be here for summer. Yes, he is. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, but anyway, uh, After John came along, Nisa didn't go with me, but she, she told me, said, I don't have anything to do uh, when you're out there running around. <laughs> I said, well, won't you get a hobby? <laughs> so after Christmas, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd leave right after Christmas, well, right after New Year's, really, and uh, work up into uh, Kansas, Oklahoma, going north in this wintertime. Omaha, uh, Lincoln. Uh, anyway, I was gone like uh, all the month of January, and I got home a couple of days at the end of January, and I'd take off uh, toward the West Coast. Well, I got home to the end of January. She said, I got me a hobby. <laughs> I said, yeah, she said, I'll sit. What kind of hobby you got? She said, raising chickens. <laughs> she said, raising chickens. She said, yeah, look in the backyard. <laughs> look there in the backyard. I had to start kind of laughing. She had two roosters and a hen. <laughs> <laughs> Texas and back into Abilene and 
See if she had any more hobbies. We <laughs> 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 do chickens. <laughs> then I, uh, well, let's see, after, uh, I go, I go, uh, uh, let's see. I'll have to curve with the middle way for every year. Uh, I want to work all the way back up into uh, uh, Arkansas, over into uh, uh, Tennessee again. Yeah, you mentioned earlier about heading north during the winter months. Was, did you drive through some blizzards during some of You those know, uh, we did Omaha at the Livestock Exchange, beautiful hall, in it? Uh, <coughs> hold about 60 squares, about on the 10th floor, I think it was. Yeah. The elevator, I said the elevator worked back then. Well, the elevator works good, yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, the bolts, they hurt me in there. Anyway, uh, it was just, it was kind of like the whole long. And, uh, and so uh, once I got them, I was lucky enough to go back each year. So we had that same old tour for 40, 42 years, I guess. And, but there'd be some changes, you know, every now. But it was lovely. I, I enjoyed it, and, and I still get. I still love to drive. Love to get on the highway. Yeah, you and uh, you uh, not sometimes, you know. Uh, Don't say a I, word about that, sir. I came up here with Wade from. Uh, we had a weekend down in Pine Bluff, and so Wade and I came back up here together. He was in his car. And you know, Wade talks with his hand. <laughs> the steering wheel didn't have a hand on it for about 10 or 12 <laughs> But I thank you for that trip. <laughs> Marshall, there's a, uh, a story about you loaning your car once to someone. Uh, what, what was that? Tell us about uh, that. We, we reported my car stolen. Yeah. <laughs> it was at the Spring Festival in Washington. And I had this phone call from this young guy from Des Moines, and he said, hey, uh, is there an extra bed in your room? I said, no, we can sleep together. <laughs> said, no, no, I said, yeah, there's an extra bed. He said, well, I'm here at White and Gladys's, and said, they're going to drive me up, or I'm going to leave my car at their house. They live in Trenton. And said, you're coming back here. He said, can I borrow your car when I leave? And uh, i got to leave my car here, and I'll just leave your car at White and Gladys's, and when you come in, well, you can pick up your car. So uh, he'd stayed in my room two nights. Well, you know, the crowds, man, they, I think there's at the Spring Festival, they run in between 4,000 and 5,000 dancers every year. And I think, what, nine cars, I believe it was. And uh, so there's a big old crowd in front of there. And uh, I was walking through the lobby over. We had parted up there and White and Gladys in the room. And this lady over, we kind of knew each other, just, uh, you know, casual. I understand. <laughs> hey, Flip, come here. I said, what did She said, the guy come through here a while ago and said, uh, hey, you better check room C24 or whatever it was. And said, there's two people that are supposed to be just one. And uh, so I said, we didn't hear this. And they people around with it didn't bother us, but he did say that. I said, what do you look like? Now, I'm a pretty tall guy, I had black hair, a little speckled gray, and I said, that's enough. Yeah. And I went back up to Whitey's room, I said, that dead gun guy went there and told him that he stayed in my room. He didn't say that, he said, there's two people in there. And, and Whitey said, let's call him John. John was a, a retired highway a captain of a highway patrol in uh, New Jersey, and uh, <coughs> long story to tell. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so he said, let's call old John and have him around. So we, we called old John, and he lived right across the street in Mighty, and, and uh, told him what kind of car it was. He said, John, do you know anybody working? He said, no, no, mall. No, everybody's working. He said, uh, can you do a little up, up, uh, trick for us? He said, no, that'd be great. He said, I'll do anything. What do you want? And he had met Ken 
the guy was named Tim Brown. And he had met Ken just then before they came up to uh, uh, down to Washington. And uh, so he always oh, said, uh, yeah. He said, can he take a joke? Oh, yeah, he can take a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so we reported, we reported the car stolen. And, and they did. They stopped him. We got in there and, and, uh, on Sunday, and, and of course, Ken had already took his car and went on and come in and get from somewhere up in there. And, and <laughs> he said, we got to, so they, uh, the, the guy told me, he said they, they got him out of the car, spread eagle him, and put his hands up on the car. He oh, wow. said, he just shaking like a leaf. He said, this your car? No, no, it's, uh, I borrowed it from a friend. He said, well, it's been reported so. <laughs> I left the clothes hanging in the back. And he said, uh, uh, these are your clothes? Yeah. He said, he's so nervous. He said, yeah. <laughs> so I, Ken never would tell me anything about that until I heard him talking to some of his Iowa friends down below, and uh, you know where the, that uh, game plane goes up in the kitchen in Kirkwood? Yep. There's a little patio down there. I heard him say, I was going up on the game plane there, get, and steal me a sandwich. And uh, I heard him say, he'll never know that they stopped me, not but wait a minute. <laughs> so he was telling all of his Iowa friends. But he wouldn't admit it. He said, yeah, I said, this, uh, this guy made me spread eagle out there and said, man, I was scared to death. He said, said uh, he said, these are your clothes in the back. I said, I told him, yeah, they were. He said, I was so nervous. The guy pulled out that, pulled out one of the shirts, said, about that big. <laughs> 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 you mean this big, you? Anyway, they didn't go into that. Uh, oh gosh, we were young again. We did all kind of crazy things, but uh, lots of fun, lots of great people. Great Maybe people. someone would like to ask Marshall a question. Or anyone would like to say anything to Marshall? Marshall Flippo. I have one comment. He was talking about how much he loved a Super Bowl. And I was very honored back in 1979 to get asked to call the Super Bowl, but I called the, the August week and Flip and Frank Lane did the February week, wasn't February yet. But the Monterey Peninsula is kind of freaky. Feb February is summertime, August is wintertime, which I did not know. And I do not really care for cold weather. And I showed up in, in there and the see the water about froze my tutu off. <laughs> I'd have been so cold in my life. And since I went pretty much by myself and so did Flip, we stayed in that place called Tide. We met the name was Tide. And all the windows all the way around faces the Pacific Ocean. It ain't never warm. The wind don't ever stop blowing. The sun never shines. By the time I got to Kirkwood Labor Day, I am just complaining with every other breath. I mean, he's a well. It's not that bad. I said, it is that bad. And I didn't know that above the bed, there's a little thing you can turn and turn to heat on. Nobody ever told me that. <laughs> And so I get back there the next year, all right? And I put my clothes away and over top there's a brick. And there's a note around this brick. It said, put the fire, keep it up and sleep with it, it'll keep you warm. You left the note for I'm saying that same old room over and tied in. Uh, I'm saying, no, tied. Tied. Tied, tied, Like uh, the, the tide coming in. They had their buildings on there, uh, about the ocean. Stay there every time, every other, I don't know, a long time, every, every year. But they had, they had in this room, they had the bowl was over here. And there was one mirror in there. And it was in between two windows. Just, and it was about that long. So you'd get all your lather on there and you'd go over here and shake. One time I went in there and heck, they had changed it around, had a big mirror right above the bowl and everything. But uh, that was a quaint place to stay with it. I wasn't the term I would use, you want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> Our next interviewee, like all the rest of them, needs no introduction, from uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas. 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 It's a real honor to be back here at Call of Lab. And see a lot of our friends. It's been a long time since we've been here. Uh, I haven't called since 
October 1986 when I had declared him a county But anyway, during my years of calling and teaching for religious, I've had a lot of funny experiences in life. I stayed with this couple in, somewhere around New York City, I forget where it was, and I, I seen Marshall. I said, hey, did you stay with these folks? He said, no, they didn't have color TV in my room. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the teaching, uh, calling around the country, and visiting with people has, has been such a gratifying thing. But to teach caller school, you're, you're stepping into a complete different area here of life. You've got these people coming to you, expect to leave your, your school sounding like Wade Driver, Marshall Flippo, or Jim Mayo. And uh, it's a big job. And I, I took the responsibility uh, very carefully and very honored. So what I did in Arkansas, I, I got my school set up, and then I started bringing in the top sporting <coughs> college in the country. Primarily the people I went through it got accreditation from call of that as a coach. Jim Mayo was us one year, I appreciated that. And I can name all the other people that was that came down, but I was also learning from these experts as they come to school. And so was the students. Uh, one of the real gratifying things about the college school was you teach these young callers, all of a sudden it dawned on me that there's a whole new, whole new thing out there. So I got talking to these callers and I said, look, I'd like to come to and call a dance with you. Oh, well, I'm not ready yet. I said, then you get ready. And you know, those people that you went and called for, they would work their ran off to off to make sure you had a big crowd when you come. And it paid well too, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I made sure that the caller, club caller got paid, all rent was paid, and then the club got 20% of whatever was left, I took out a little piece to 80%. <laughs> I remember one time, one of my first tours, I went to Kansas. This was in the early 50s. I don't get to the name of this town, but anyway, I had the wife and two kids on, so I asked them to get me a babysitter, okay? But I, anyway, I got paid $25 to call it and dance. The babysitter cost me $30. <laughs> it didn't take me long to know I could take my wife and kids on Thursday. But I tell you, it's, it's gratifying. The experience that you have working with people is just out, outstanding. I got a letter from Mr. Yonder. And here's what he said. He said, if I come to your college school, can I go home and teach a class and start calling for a club? Now let me tell you something. I didn't answer that one day. I thought about that for two weeks. And Sharon said, what are you going to say to him? I said, I got it. I wrote him a letter back and I said, it all depends on your ability to learn. He did tell me he was a college professor from Stillwater, Oklahoma with 25 degrees and everything you want to cover. I said, Sharon, what have I got myself into? <laughs> the gentleman came. So Sunday night, I handed out a little bit of work for people to do for Monday morning. And when he got his assignment, I looked around, I looked back, he was gone. And I, I said, what did I say? So Monday morning, when everybody come, this gentleman was the most prepared person there to do his thing. And I, I just said, yeah, I've got to find out about this guy. So I was using a little thing I'd set up and let the guys get the people back home. So I put four men over here and four girls over here. And I said, Carl, you're up next. <laughs> so he came up and he said, now I, well, let me make sure I understand exactly what you want me to do. You want me to get those people back home with their partners in a proper square. I said, that's right, sir. So he cleared his throat and he said, square your sex. <laughs> staff for as long as I continued to call. His name was Carl Anderson. Wow. Him and his wife both have uh, 
Gallo, and uh, <coughs> they were very dear friends, and he was a wonderful person. He bought my business when I started in 1982. And I thought, sure, man, he'd pick this up and run with it. But it didn't work out that way. His wife tried to tell me, but I was stubborn headed, and I still didn't tell him anyway. But anyway, I, uh, doctors told me, I was in Chicago called the Nets, and I got sick. So I told Sarah, I said, we put them home. And I said, call doctor, our doctor, tell him I want to go to the hospital. So we didn't go to Detroit to the advance. I got callers lined up at my place and so forth and so on. Dave Taylor took a lot of my things. I went back home and put me in the hospital. I was there a week. So when they, four doctors came into my room and they said, what do you do? I said, I call sport music. Well, how many, how many sport music do you call? I had one of my sheets on my schedule. <laughs> and I said, wow. They said, it's up to you. We said, if you want to keep living, they said, you better quit doing what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. So Sharon and I talked it over, so I quit calling. And I'm doing good. I, my, everything is coming back to balance. And Frank Crockett, what's his name? Crockett's dog. John. Yeah. John, John called me and he says, Cal, he said, we can't have to call a lab with you. I said, I ain't coming. He said, yeah, you are. And he called me two or three times and I went. I came. And before I left, a club from the village out there came and said, Cal, we need a caller and we want you to be our caller. And I thought about that and I said, I'll let you know. So I went to the call of that. I got motivated. <laughs> I told my wife, I said, call that club and tell them I'll take it. I just bought me a new hill. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, I, I, we're running out of time here, but let me tell you, the gratifying thing that I got out, out, of, out of teaching was to see the callers go and make something out of themselves and take what, well, what they learned from me and I learned from other people and share it with them. I shared everything with them. I told them the good, the bad, and everything else. But I've had a couple of callers that I'm asked to leave my caller school. Now, let me tell you why. If they come with their wives and they call me that what they wanted to do in Spurgeon's calling, then I ask them, have you talked this over with your wife? And does she approve of you doing it? He said, no, she don't approve it. I said, here, I'll give you your money back and you go home. Because I'm going to tell you right now, Frank, without her help, you ain't going to make it. You've got to have that support, especially if you're married. Ain't that right, Mr. Steiner? That's not. That's my sweetheart her, and her husband, which uh, I, I think <coughs> some things people do for you. Her husband was out of school and his, what was his name, Lawrence? Uh, Sheldon. Sheldon Lawrence. Mm -hmm. And they talked to me one day and they said, Kelsey, if you ever call the Kansas State Festival, I said, no, I haven't. They said, you will. And all of a sudden, these two guys are running Kansas State spreading things that old cow got them and take to home. <laughs> so I went. I, I got to tell you something. In the calling field, I, I would be what he would call the club caller, called call some clubs, and I got into the events because I was forced to, but I got out fast, I got in it. But anyway, uh, it was a square right in front of me. And they did everything in the world had nothing to do with spring. <laughs> they flipped over people's back it is, and I tried to ignore them, but it was pretty hard, you know. But anyway, we got through the festival. But I've been calling a lot back east, and one year, they found Barn, I said, I won't be back next year. So he, he thought about that. He's coming to, I stayed with me, and he said, Cal said, why aren't you coming back? I said, man, I can't please these big people. He said, what are you talking about? I said, I want you back. I said, if you do, but I said, in danger, no. He said, why not? I said, man, they are giving me a hard time. You can't do it. What are you going to call something complicated? What are you going to do this? I just wasn't that type of caller. So he asked me, he said, what will it take for you to come back? I said, you advertise what kind of dance I'm going to call. Okay. Went down to Big Bad Bar and went on down to the <coughs> New York City, down by New York City, with Ponderosa in this big hall. Yeah, yeah and beautiful. I've been coming there, but man, I, I'd leave tired.
because these people were pushing me to do this and do that, and I want to keep everybody dancing. So I told him, I said, uh, well, I he didn't know I wasn't coming back. So in a few weeks he called me, he said, uh, why aren't you coming back? I told him the same story. He said, man, we can take care of that. I said, you advertise, and you give me a copy of your advertising. So I went, here it comes. What are you going to do then? I just picked up that piece of paper and I said, can you read them? <laughs> <laughs> so that people went away with hurt because and I, I seen it. So I went up and I said, I said, I'll tell you what, if you will stay after everybody leaves, I'll call you <coughs> down the Chicago Station. But he and I were in other bitches before they couldn't do what I was talking. You know, when you challenge a caller, if he knows what he's talking about, you ain't going to dance it for the rest of the evening. Yeah. He can do it, all he has to do is cut his time in half, and you ain't going no more. But I did not enjoy calling to those people like that. I enjoyed calling square dancing because it was fun. It had a lot of fellowship in it. That was my belief in square dancing. So I kind of kept a simple law on the road. I had two simple dances. One was awful step on the other was simply awful. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank y'all for letting me come in and talk to you, and uh, we are love you. Did some square dancing in, over there that introduced it, and now in Germany is, uh, and France have great clubs. Can you tell us a little, some of those things? The World's Fair, in particular. <laughs> In life, you ever have the opportunity to be married to a woman for 40 years and God takes her away from you and you meet someone else? It pretty well stacks up to that. And you're going to marry her. This is really an honor. I'll be married May the 3rd to a wonderful woman in Hot Springs, Arkansas. You're all welcome. I'll give you an invitation now. <laughs> right outside of Hot Springs in the Park Avenue, it's a uh, Beautiful wedding chapel there. <laughs> it just so happens my new wife owns it. <laughs> 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 so we can we can take all your weddings. <laughs> Germany, 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 Germany. I'm stationed in England, and I read this piece of paper that they're going to have a big square dance in Germany. So I wrote to people, and boy, he said, right back, please come. So. Uh, my first wife and I went, King and I went over, and they greeted us, and we went up to Van Billigan. They did not know how many people were going to show up. There were 430 square dancers showed up from all over Europe, but we had a ball. And one morning, the man came in and said, Cal, there's some newsreel people outside wants to put square dancers so Germany <coughs> see it. To the best of my knowledge, German people had not seen American Square Dancing in 1955. So we made these newsreels. And I got to go in uh, one of the theaters and it was showing this newsreel. And them German people started clapping their hands and their feet. It was absolutely unbelievable. And that kid from Arkansas was gone. And pretty soon my boss said, uh, you know, said, uh, I was going over there so much. They were asking me back to do this and that. And we got the Dancers Association going, the Caller Association going. Both of those are still going, God bless them. Not what I did, but what they're doing. And here a while back they invited me to be the, uh, for their 50th anniversary, to be on the cover of the magazine that they put out. Of course, I mean, you know, I thought about that for about two minutes. <laughs> and I said, yes, I was very, very honored at that. In England, we did not do that much uh, during the time that I was in England because to work in England in those years that I was uh, the communist people, thing was so strong downtown, they wouldn't let you go up here unless you had permission from the FBI and so forth. So, so I didn't do a lot in, in England looking back to it. But we did a lot of innovation that English people came down. My farewell dance there, we had 800 people in that dance. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you something, I know now what's the matter with my kidneys. <laughs> <laughs> I'd get off the stage and 
best the bathroom was right straight in the back. If there ever was a time that I thought about going, that was it. I never made it that bathroom in those three hours. <laughs> and I marched everybody out of that hall when that dance was over so I could get some bathroom. <laughs> uh, then we went back to Germany for four years and uh, we did a lot of things, but I didn't do as much as I'd like to because I had a job that was second by now. I had the NCO Club, Ranch 9 Air Force Base, and I had the five clubs, 6,000 members, 375 employees. And I was working about 17 hours a day to leave a lot of time at home. Squirties. But we too, I got elected president of the Car Association, so naturally we had the next festival at Ranch 9 Air Force Base. <laughs> I we commander called me Bill, Bill called, so I called him with that. I said, sir, I need to talk to you. And uh, I met him in the gym. And he said, what are you doing here? I said, we're not going to be squirting you. People are going to come from all over Germany here. And he said, well, what's your problem? I said, you can hear in this line of I said, I need three parachutes. He said, you're great. I said, I know that, but I'm like the parachutes. <laughs> <laughs> I like the parachutes. You know, I learned one thing in life, people. You ain't never going to know unless you ask. You got to ask me. Because when I was at school, you could grab me. I just knew she was going to say no. So it took me eight hours to tell her my life story. And she said, you know, I, I would have said yes seven and a half hours. Literally an hour. But Sharon was, a, Sharon was a wonderful person. I miss her. I will love her as long as I live. And I owe her an awful lot. But she said yes. You know, I thought, well, we'll hear it by the year, we'll have an engagement. And that was, yeah, that was Saturday. <laughs> Tuesday, I picked up, I uh, did pick up the paper, some people said, congratulations, and yeah. I said, for what? Did you get married? I said, I am. <laughs> <laughs> she put that in the stars and stripes that we get married a certain date, and we did. <laughs> we had 40 years of a wonderful life. Uh, Tell us something about uh, the people you broke in over there when you was. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, I don't have that book. It's too bad you can't get one of those books. The Square Inch Car is a salesman. It's a Square Inch Car. I got pictures of all those people. A lot of those people that I booked. Charlie Pratt, Jane Vansfield, Tex Ritter, Rocky Marciano. What was I doing with the Rocky Horse <laughs> He put 45 minutes of his tapes together in his greatest spot. So I put him. He came, had dinner. I would have bought him a pair of tennis shoes. This man was broke. Absolutely broke. Anyway, he came about 15 minutes time for him to go on. He shut in my office. Folks, the sweat was just poured off of this man. I said, Rocky, I said, what's the matter? He said, he said, no, I'm scared to death. I said, why? He said, I've never done this before. This was his first show. I didn't know that. <laughs> I got to him. I said, Rocky, these 800 people right here are your fans. They're your friends. They're going to like you. He walked out on that stage and got people stood up and broke with him. And he said, you're my kind of people. <laughs> One old sister over the corner said, how's that, Mr. Marciana? He said, you're all drunk. <laughs> 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 I booked him for 45 minutes. He went an hour and 45 minutes. And at the end of the show, this by this time, this little sister over here got pretty loaded. She said, Mr. Marciana, in your younger days, should you have looked at him straight? <laughs> he said, now, ma'am, he said, if I told you I couldn't, I'd be lying. Well, not at that time, I screwed this up. <laughs> and anyway, it, it was the last thing he asked. He said, if I told you I could, I'd be bragging. But if I told you I couldn't, I'd be lying. <laughs> <laughs> Jane Vansfield, I had her for eight hours. <laughs> what do you mean you had her? Happened to you know, 
I was in the officer's club when I went over there. You know, I called a subordination in that officer's club 10 years prior to me being the manager here. Nobody I never seen that. So this new wing commander comes <coughs> from France. They kick us out of France. And he wants a breakfast for all everybody. So I'm putting this on from the officer's club. So all of my people, they have to leave and work the club and fix it. And then I'm left there to clean up the dishes. So I'm cleaning up the dishes. And this colonel came over, I knew who he was. He said, who are you? I said, I'm Senior Master Sergeant Cal Golden, and I'm the second most important man on this place. I don't know where that comes from. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I, well, he said, who's number one? I said, well, Colonel, you are. He said, what makes your job so important? I said, it's my job to keep the morale of the officers on this base at a high peak so you can give a news a day, work out of them, and we can make you general. He said, sit down, sir. <laughs> <laughs> he did make me chief. Start them. Oh, yeah. One other thing, uh, when I first made my first tour, I realized that I could not make a living out of what I was making calling. I mean, the hall wasn't big enough for me to charge it up. So I could figure out new ways to make money. So I started taking my records along and calling them, and that was fantastic. And if these guys were telling the truth, I was the biggest distributor of their records in the country. <laughs> <laughs> but I bought them and I sold them at Collar School. It was unbelievable. Yeah. And one, I think, one thing I want to say, because I was, I was just reminiscing yes last night with with Kel for one of the biggest thrills of my life which national was it Memphis it was Memphis I you know the Kel's up at he's MC and he come in and looked at me and he got flipping Tex Brownlee who just passed away and y'all come on stage I'm looking around I said y'all let me grow up we're gonna be all right you know because Texas about this high but anyway we got up there and we closed that national convention that Saturday night but God bless America, it's one of the biggest thrills of my life. Mine too, because they, I tell you, they backed me up and I, I sounded like something else. Some people were hollering and talking me about, but they got to take just one last thing. I'm doing a festival down in Russell Shoals, Alabama, with Tony Oxendine and Pat Barber. They backed me up on God bless America, and of course it sounded so good with them singing behind me. And, I said, guys, I sure want to thank you for making me sound so good. You know, Pat Morrison, my cow, he said, you're a legend. I, I said, thank you. I didn't know what a legend was, so I went home and looked it up in the dictionary. Do you know what a legend is? It's a house been. <laughs> Well, I want to thank all of you. Thank you for being here.